Welcome to our webinar, Sales and Operations Planning, the Movement from Volume to Value. I'm your host, Helen King. Sales and Operations Planning aligns a business and when done well, supports an effective supply chain. However, effective isn't always efficient. On today's webinar, we will discuss how to move from an SNOP process, which focuses on the volume of information to manage, to focusing on the value potential in an optimal SNOP process. Before I hand this over to Laura, there are a few things I want to cover with you. We are recording today's session, and we'll post it to our on-demand webinars page. You can visit our website to listen to this or any of our other webinars. Additionally, we will send slides out to all attendees within 24 hours of the broadcast. We encourage you to share these slides with others in your organization, and if you have questions, reach out to Laura or myself to set up a discussion. We also want to hear your questions about our findings, so please post to the Q&A function to the left of your screen. We've left time at the end of the webinar to address your questions. Finally, we will be live tweeting the webinar so if you'd like to join the social media conversation, you can use the hashtag SCIWebinar and the handle SCInsightsLLC during the event. Now let me introduce your host, Laura Ciceri, founder of Supply Chain Insights. As an enterprise strategist, Laura focuses on the changing face of enterprise technologies. Her research is designed for the early adopter seeking first mover advantage. She comes to the stage with over 40 years of diverse supply chain experience. Welcome, Laura. Hey, thank you so much, Helen. And we've got a big audience today. I think we had over 500 people sign up for this webinar. And, you know, we're doing it because people have asked us to go back and repeat uh, the work we've done on sales and operations planning. So I'm excited today to share. And I'm hoping that everyone puts their questions in the chat panel so that we can have a dialogue. And, of course, we do share all of our research openly, and this is part of our monthly webcast series. So thank you for hosting it, and thanks for people for joining us. So let's get started. I want to talk today about the movement of sales and operations planning from volume to value. As a research analyst, I have been working on the evolution of sales and operations planning for the last two decades. And there are lots of consultants that wave their hands in the air and use three and four letter acronyms and say, you know, hey, this is a cool project. But to me, sales and operations planning is a journey, not a sprint. And it's not really something that is a project. Instead, I think it has to be at the fiber and the DNA of the company to work horizontally. And what's happened is we have put in technologies and processes that make efficient silos but don't necessarily drive effective supply chains. Let me just repeat that because I think that's a really important concept. We've put in technologies that make efficient silos. So we've put in CRM for sales, for contact management that makes efficient sales pipeline, but not necessarily effective connection to the customer. We've put in transportation management, which looks at how do we make transportation more efficient, lower the cost of transportation. But as we've talked in earlier webinars, that if I want to manage total cost, I have to manage cost as a decathlete. I have to sometimes be second or third within a function to really look at the trade-offs of cost and to be able to lower total cost. And only 12% of companies can effectively see total cost. So we've got transportation management, which is trying to maximize the volume in a truck, maximize the efficiency of transportation. We've got advanced planning, which is trying to help us with decision support of translating forecasting to supply chain planning. And most of that work has been focused on safety stock, not on form and function of inventory. So again, we can get efficiency, but not necessarily effectiveness. And I've got SRM, which has been put into procurement to reduce procurement spend, but reducing procurement spend some, sometimes be counter to what we need to do to reduce total cost or improve value. So this discussion about effectiveness is a very important one. And I find that most companies do not define 
supply chain broadly enough. So uh, when I talk about supply chain, I'm talking about the processes from the customer's customer to the supplier to supplier horizontally across the company and across value networks. So we don't define that well enough in terms of what defines excellence. And we also don't define value. And one of the first steps of our journey is getting really clear on what does that look like and how do I go from a volume-based analysis of matching demand and supply to driving value. Now at Supply Chain Insights, we do open surveys. We work with our LinkedIn contacts and the contacts in our database, and we do a quantitative survey every month. And we give those surveys away as open content for audiences, and we do free monthly webinars. And last year, one of the things we did was we took five years of quantitative analysis, and we took a value-based statement of price to tangible book, and we said, what is the correlation of 65 different elements. So we looked at, did people have a common instance of ERP? Did they rate their advanced planning system to effective? Did they have consistency of leadership for a certain period? How were they organized? So we looked at 65 different factors and we've published this. And we're in the process of doing this again with a data lake and more sophisticated analytics, but this is where we were at from our study last year. We found that the most effective and the highest correlation of price to tangible book value, which is one of the value statements that we use. We either use market capitalization, which is the number of shares outstanding by price, or price to tangible book value, which throws out intangibles. Sometimes people will use EBITDA, but there needs to be a clear definition in your organization for value. But when we looked at the correlation to value of price to tangible book, we found four of 65 factors to have some low level of correlation. The first was an effective center of excellence. Now, an effective center of excellence helps to guide us in three important ways in sales and operations planning. One is, what is the definition of supply chain excellence, which is not a trivial discussion of how do I align cross-functionally to really drive value? The second is helping the organization to understand what is value. And the third is defining governance of how should I plan? Should I plan at the regional level, at the local level? How should I plan at the global level? And how does the organization work together to drive an effective horizontal process of sales and operations planning. That's also not easy because often we put in technology. So we've got a large planning project or we've got a large ERP project and we've got a focus on the implementation of the technology, but we don't step back and say, where should we plan and how should we plan? The first step is looking at a profit center map of where in the organization do I have profit centers? And that's where you should start to ask the question of which profit centers should be driving value in sales and operations planning, and what does that look like? And how do I align governance so that the right people are calling the shots, which are typically arranged around that profit center? And how do I plan globally and execute locally which gets into the design of governance of who should plan and why and what's the frequency of planning around the supply chain moments of truth. That profit center map and that governance and the definition of supply chain excellence needs to happen at that supply chain center of excellence. Now we're going to see that most people that have a supply chain center of excellence consider that it's not effective and one of the issues is that we are not driving that kind of dialogue, which is important because the supply chain is a complex, nonlinear system, and we've got to break the traditional paradigms of efficient silos. Now, the second factor, which has the highest correlation of price to tangible book, is sales and operations planning effectiveness. And when we ask companies, 
is your supply chain effective? And we have them rate SNOP effectiveness on a scale of one through seven or one through five. We find some common characteristics. One is a clear definition of supply chain excellence and governance, as I talked about earlier. But the second is balance in the S and the OP. And if you call this IBP, it's the balance in integrated planning between commercial teams and operations teams. And I don't get caught up in the nomenclature. Everybody feels like they've got to have their unique three-letter, four-letter acronym. It's like I don't really focus there. I focus on this horizontal process that helps to align between commercial and operation teams in the tactical planning horizon. Now, when people have balance between the commercial and the operations teams, they're able to orchestrate bidirectionally. And this is very different than integration. Bidirectional orchestration allows you to do what-if analysis between your go-to-market plans and your operational constraints and opportunities to be able to look back and forth between go-to-market opportunities and risk and your operational opportunities and risks to do things like look at alternate buying strategies or alternate contract manufacturing strategies or alternate bills of material or alternate market strategies or test and learn strategies in the market or looking at how you change cost to serve. So this bi-directional orchestration is a lot around aligning for value and aligning on a plan that you know has a probability of error, so you're not just looking at fixed numbers, and a probability of supply. And that plan is done at a cadence typically monthly, can be quarterly, and then it's executed at a weekly level. Now, the execution team is a smaller team that really is driving the playbook off of the sales and operations plan. But again, it goes across the function functions and is well focused on what defines supply chain excellence and governance. Now the third factor that drives the highest correlation of price to tangible book is second and third tier visibility and supplier reliability. So the ability to take those horizontal processes across the supply base and to manage a network. Most companies have orchestrated efficient silos within their enterprise. So what I want you to learn from this is let's start with clear definitions, clear definition of governments, get really clear on what is value, and break traditional paradigms. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you research. And again, Helen has explained we share all of our slides freely, and you're welcome to use these within your organization. That's the value of open content. So when we did a recent study on supply chain finance and we looked at the current state and maturity of companies, a lot of companies have focused on the implementation of ERP. And ERP does not necessarily give you the best foundation for sales and operations planning. In fact, there's confusion that I need a tightly integrated decision support tool to the transactional tools. And really an SNOP to drive the most value you need to be able to do what-if analysis and orchestration that's not tightly integrated, that allows you to take inputs, do the analysis, look at the what-if conditions, and when you're ready, push back that data. Tight integration to ERP typically will have you focus on the reactive, not the important. In sales and operations planning, as we talk about the transition to value, is about the important. It's about cross-functional alignment. Now you can see that in this study, 77% of companies had a sales and operations planning process, 52% had a cost to serve process. We find that in companies with the most advanced sales and operations planning process, they will also usually have a cost to serve analysis to look at that bi-directional orchestration and alignment with the commercial teams. And they also typically would have a supply chain finance group and a supply chain center of excellence and then also supplier development programs that look at how do I best orchestrate into supply. So again, we're looking at the horizontal processes from the customer's customer to the supplier's supplier. 
Now, I teach a boot camp where I have people come and face-to-face. We share case studies. And one of the things I have people do is draw a supply chain. And interestingly, when people pick up a crayon to draw a supply chain, almost always the paradigm is to start with the supplier. In the highest value sales and operations planning processes, the start is with the customer, and it's with the options for the customer and go-to-market strategies. So one of the issues that we find is even though companies have processes like sales and operations planning or supply chain finance or supply chain center of excellence or supplier development, success is a flip of a coin. And the gap is the lack of clarity about what is a supply chain, and companies like Cisco redefine the process so that it can not be so constrained by a fixed paradigm of the supply chain as a functional group, but instead from the customer's customer to supplier's supplier. So what is the supply chain? What is business effectiveness? And what are the goals and the balanced portfolio? And we do a lot of writing around the metrics that matter, which we feel are growth, return on invested capital, operating margin and inventory turns, and we see the highest market capitalization and highest price to tangible book when people have a balanced portfolio in that nonlinear supply chain system. And it has to require education of supply chain finance because supply chain finance is typically looking for the lowest cost and the most efficient supply chain, which is often the most volume for the least input. And that is typically the efficient supply chain definition. But as we look at the long tail and we look at the balance of the supply chain, the efficient supply chain is not the most effective because sometimes I can't have the lowest cost when I have very low volumes that are lumpy. And the way that I demonstrate that to someone in supply chain finance is through network design and discrete event simulation tools that show that with the probability of demand being very high at 60 or 70 percent, the effective supply chain design has got to include buffers and postponement strategies and the design of the supply chain for that issue. Now, the Supply Chain Center of Excellence comes into play again for the definition of value, the definition of governance, and the definition of this balanced portfolio. So when we look at this, today's success is a flip of a coin, and I feel that it doesn't have to be. And one of the points on the journey is starting with cross-functional alignment. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on that because one of the characteristics we see in the highest value producing sales and operations planning processes is the balance between the S and the OP. And if you're questioning if you're balanced or if you're aligned, we can help you with that. We have current benchmarking that's working on satisfaction within supply chain and alignment within supply chain. And we have a database of 7,000 responses that would allow you to bounce your data against our database and find out where you are. But that's a topic for a different day. Let's start with what is cross-functional alignment? What do I mean by ability to use and access data and supply chain visibility and the ability to look at demand and supply, not as a set of numbers, but as a probability of demand and embrace volatility? And then how do I improve executive understanding? So as we look at sales and operations planning, one of the biggest issues is horizontal team alignment. Now, four years ago, we did a study And we had a peer group, and we asked the supply chain team to tell us where they had alignment issues. So we looked at what was the most important and what was the current performance. And you can see that the gap was between the sales teams, commercial teams, and operations. Biggest gap. Probably not a surprise to the people on the phone. But then when we asked the same team to start to tell us about The finance gap, so this is a view of finance, finance does not see that alignment issue. They see that, you know, the functions should just work well. They don't see the need for the definition of supply chain. And you've got to help them with, you know, this is a big need because they don't see the gap. 
And the IT group doesn't see the gap either. So in the same company, the supply chain team with SNOP is feeling this gap for alignment. And that gap is not seen by finance, not seen by senior leadership, and not seen by IT. And so what you've got to do is you've got to help educate the larger group about the difference between efficient and effective and show the effectiveness of the supply chain through discrete event simulation to be able to look at the trade-offs of today's organization because the functions are not set up to work together. And these efficient silos, sourcing is looking for high volumes, large quantities, large lead times. Manufacturing is looking for long runs, stable volume, high buffer inventories. Logistics is looking for full loads of transportation. And the customer service teams are looking for availability, flexibility, and responsiveness. And people are like, well, why can these teams just not align? And our IT systems are pulling us apart. They're making these silos more efficient and the SNOP process and the supply chain centers of excellence have got to bring them together through balanced portfolios, horizontal processes, and clear definitions and governance. And that is a journey. It's not a project. When I talk to teams that have moved from a focus on volume to a focus on value, these teams have been working hard at five to seven years on these factors. And often when I talk to teams that have just implemented ERP or just implemented planning systems, and it was a project, and it was implemented by a team of consultants as a project, and they don't have this understanding that they've got to do this hard work, they won't make the progress. They'll get stuck in some of the early definitions. So on the journey, sales and operations planning has got to be defined as a horizontal process within other horizontal processes to drive value. And this includes revenue management. In different industries, it, revenue management means different things. It could mean price management or trade promotion management and consumer products, or it could be returns management or rebate management. But it's the ability for us to gauge the effectiveness of commercial actions and our go-to-market strategies. And often the link between revenue management and sales and operations planning is cost to serve. And cost to serve tools are becoming more available and it allows us to do this at a regular cadence. The other piece is connection of sales and operations planning to new product launch. Using techniques like attach rate and attribute based forecasting and what if analysis to be able to look at the new products and how they are cannibalizing existing products and what is a realistic forecast for that new product launch. Often new products will have a forecast of 70 to 80% error, but also 40 to 50% bias. And the ability to actually have the discussion about what is a realistic forecast and to test and learn in market in vitro to do the bi-directional orchestration with the new product launch teams is very, very essential to use that channel data to look at effectiveness. And then also the tie to corporate social responsibility and how we're actually managing the supply chain for the planet and the connection to supplier development, supplier diversity, and our supplier networks. So the building of horizontal processes and SNOP as one of the key planks is important, and these need to be aligned to value. Whatever your value statement is, align it and build those balanced portfolios. Now, companies don't have one SNOP process. They'll have four to six, and sometimes they'll have up to 30. But each of the processes should be aligned for balance, and this is something that we test when we go in and we look at sales and operations planning processes is, how balanced is the S with the OP? How aligned are the commercial teams to the operations team? And how clear are these two teams on alignment on value? And that's usually a big gap because there's a lack of understanding about what this should be, and there's not the reporting structure 
to the reporting profit center leaders. So to create balance, what you've got to do is you've got to look at market drivers and sense markets through the channel, not just rely on orders and shipments, and then focus not just on safety stock, but focus on the form and function of inventory. And we'll define that a little later on, but it looks at where should I place inventory in the supply chain as the best buffer, and how do I design the supply chain for these buffers to manage in transit stock, cycle stock, seasonal stock, and safety stock. There's been too narrow of a focus on safety stock when the biggest opportunity right now is in cycle stock. And then how do I design this network to be able to optimize across these functions to maximize the balanced portfolio and bi-directionally orchestrate into the commodity strategies in the network? And that's the hard part in terms of creating balance getting clear on the goal, and then being able to drive alignment on these processes. Now the second issue is getting to data. And I have a question about what forms of analytics beyond what if and cost to serve that I found most impactful in increasing the value derived from SNOP. The ability to get to the right data in the timely fashion is often driven by the fact that we don't have very good planning master data. And often people have looked at master data as transactional data, as customer data, supplier data, manufacturing data, or transactional data, but they haven't really thought about planning master data. And planning master data deals not only with what is a lead time, but what's the variability of the lead time and how does it change based upon the seasons? And how do plants vary based upon what they're producing. And so companies that really are good at sales and operations planning will have a reference database of planning master data. So they'll bring in actuals around lead times and run times and you know, our go-to-market lead times, and they'll build a database of planning master data so that when they do advanced planning runs, they can look at what the lead time variability is for that season or that run, and then they can look at the variance. Building this planning master data and the context of the data is important to being able to do effective sales and operations planning runs. The other thing is the ability to load data quickly and to process the data. One of the issues that many times people have is they haven't aligned their systems to allow them to do what-if analysis and to be able to do this more effectively. And they haven't tested the business models to say, does what I'm doing in planning reflect the business? And as a result, what we have are a lot of Excel ghettos where we've got a lot of spreadsheet jockeys, and I'll show you some of that data. But you cannot manage a nonlinear complex system in an Excel spreadsheet as a global corporation very well. And so getting those planning systems to reflect the real business is important. And that requires fine-tuning the algorithms and looking at how do I tune that over time to give me better answers. Now, one of the things that I find really exciting is the evolution of artificial intelligence and cognitive learning into decision support, which is going to help us immensely on exception management and the management of planning master data. And I have a few case studies at my conference in September where we'll be showcasing some of that. And that is causing a redefinition of decision support for the horizontal supply chain. But only about 7% of companies are moving to that kind of cognitive value statements in artificial intelligence. And so early adopters are moving there, and it's starting to redefine the space. If you're an early adopter, you should be experimenting. If you're a late adopter, you should be following. And if you can't come to my conference, hopefully you can watch the live cast, because we're going to live cast it everywhere. The other thing is the lack of understanding and support from the executive team. When you have these executive team meetings, it should be about what decisions do you need them to make. It should not be you know, cranking through the numbers. There's a cadence that people need to know. So the first issue is, do I have balance? The second issue is, 
can I get the data? And as I think about data, I've got to think about planning master data. I've got to think about the fit of the engines and the fit of the output and the ability for what-if analysis and to crank through the plans in a reasonable period of time. The old traditional advanced planning systems took a long time because they were very limited by 64-bit architectures and memory. Today, our in-memory processes allow us to crank through data much quicker. Now, this issue of cross-functional alignment is best served through discrete event simulation and network design to allow us to see across the company to be able to drive alignment. And we've got to close the process gaps to look at not just numbers, sales and operations planning to drive value isn't about just cranking numbers. It's about managing the probability, demand, and supply and looking at opportunities, risk analysis, and coming up with a playbook. It's a lot like, you know, a pre-game meeting in a football room where they're talking about the plays and, you know, what happens if X happens on the field and tying that playbook to execution. It must be connected to execution and aligned to value at the profit center level. And to get there, I need what-if analysis, and only about 33% of companies can effectively run what-if analysis. And then we have to be able to align the technologies to deliver the most profitable plan, which allows us to really look at total cost and opportunity and profitability and to align with supply chain finance. These process gaps are huge for most companies because We've not implemented the systems to allow us to do that or the process understanding. So unfortunately, because we haven't done that hard work, most companies are using Excel spreadsheets and multiple systems, and we just can't do this in a spreadsheet. And we've got to fight the issue of spreadsheet ghettos and Excel spreadsheet jockeys because it does not allow us to move at the speed We've got to have role-based views for individuals of the company. We've got to have technologies that allow us to determine the most profitable plan and have those blessed by finance and to be able to run what-if analysis. So let's talk about this role-based views for a minute. You know, if you draw a Venn diagram, at the center of the Venn diagram are hardcore planners. And hardcore planners need to be able to really delve into the plan, the constraints, the buffers, and do the hardcore work for the plan. And that requires a deep tool to do that modeling. And that tool needs to be fine-tuned for the output, and you've got to say, you know, is this giving me a good output? But you also need a layer for visualization, and these are for your business executives that need to see the output and they need to see it in a business frame, not necessarily a planning frame. And that's actually some of the work that's happening with this next generation of sales and operations planning, where I complement this hardcore modeling with visualization. Both are important. We cannot get there without hardcore modeling, and we can't really align the business leaders without a layer of visualization. And then you need another layer that connects you to finance, balance sheet, and income statement, and this balanced portfolio so you can look at the impact of decisions in this playbook against that balanced portfolio. Now, as companies go through the maturity to be able to maximize opportunity and risk and to move and orchestrate market to market, they run into issues, and change management is live and well at most companies. The first issue is the role of the budget. If you assume that sales and operations planning is to maximize the compliance to the budget, you will never get to value. The budget is wrong the minute it is produced, and one of the things you've got to educate the team on is the role of the budget is not the goal of sales and operations planning. Instead, what you've got to do is maximize opportunity, mitigate risk, and then revise the budget based upon SNOP. That is not well understood by supply chain finance and requires a lot of work. 
The second is, what is profitability? So I talked about only 12% of companies have a clear signal of what is total profitability. I'm not talking about manufacturing profitability or transportation or these silos. I'm talking about the trade-offs between source, make, and deliver. Only 12% of companies can see total cost. You need to get to total cost, and you need to have those total costs blessed by finance and be able to orchestrate the trade-offs between source, make, and deliver and have that agreed on with supply chain finance. That requires quite a bit of work and also will all use descriptive analytics that allows us to go across the functions and to visualize the total cost of decisions. Then we get into what-if analysis, and I talked about only 30% of companies have what-if analysis. When you do RFPs for decision support tools for either revenue management or supply chain planning, you need to include what-if analysis as part of the decision, and you also need to move outside in to use channel data, not just rely on order and shipment data. So when I talk about form and function of inventory, because I think this is a really important discussion, in the movement to value, inventory is my most important buffer. And most people look at inventory as, you know, a pocket to take money out of. And they play with cash to cash in bad ways. And our ability to manage inventory allows us to buffer supply and demand. And most people are only looking at safety stock. Now, safety stock optimization has been an output of advanced planning for a long time, which is the ability to have inventory requirements to buffer demand and supply. But when we look holistically at form and function of inventory, which is a large step on value, I first make a decision of where should I hold materials in the supply chain. The more I hold materials as a finished good, the less effective I am at balancing demand error and demand probability. When I push the materials back in the supply chain and I am able to embrace late stage postponement and I can have platform rationalization, then I'm able to have more flexibility and agility in the supply chain. And network design goes hand in hand with sales and operations planning to drive value. But also, sales and operations planning goes hand in hand with the decisions about in transit inventories. How do I ship? And what is the value of that inventory in transit? And how well does that fit into bi-directional orchestration with longer lead times in the ports and the issues that we have of offloading the ocean cargo in transit inventories are growing. And most people don't understand that that is a drag on supply chain agility. The biggest opportunity for companies in driving inventory to be more effective is in cycle stock. And I'm amazed as an analyst how we've forgotten some of the first fundamental principles of the rhythm wheel and the management of the manufacturing for cycles, which allows us to make decisions about when to run certain products based upon sales and operations planning. The sales and operations planning playbook should drive our cycle stock because our manufacturing plan needs to go over multiple weeks. When I used to run a factory, my cycle stock would go over three and a half weeks. And when you interrupt the cycle, then you're going to add issues around reliability and inventory and perhaps cause quality issues. And then I've got to manage my seasonal items and my promoted items. So in an effective sales and operations planning process, I have a network design workshop that's looking at form and function of inventory in that playbook. So with that, let me just take some questions uh, from the audience. You know, some people say, what's the role of technology? Of course, we've got to have technology, but... I think that sales and operations planning is about 60% change management, 30% process, and 10% technology. 
you can't get there without technology, but you've got hard work on this organizational change management and really being able to drive what uh, we're doing. So uh, Voss is saying, can I talk about the need for tight integration to ERP? You know, only about 45% of the data in most sales and operations planning systems comes from ERP. Yes, we need orders. Yes, we need shipments. Yes, we need definitions. But it's the data that, you know, is planning master data, you know, cycles, uh, lead times, that is really critical to planning. And so there's an erroneous assumption that I need a tight integration to, um, you know, ERP, and that's really not sufficient. And so one of the pitfalls that people have is they put in ERP, and then they think, well, you know, I've just got what I need for sales and operations planning. But I need a decision support tool that allows me to model the supply chain and make trade-offs. So other questions, uh, please put them in the box. But, you know, one of the things that I think we've got to be clear of, when we ask people to plan, we've got to allow them time to plan. And one of the research areas we've been looking at is what are the barriers to effective planning? And one of them is that when we have a person that is supposed to do the urgent and also the important. So maybe they're doing orders or shipments or supply chain execution, and when they have spare time, they'll do supply chain planning. Guess what? Supply chain planning and SNOP never happens. Likewise, when I have an organization that is always focused on rewarding the urgent and the reactive, I'll never get good at sales and operations planning. So I've got to be able to create a culture that allows me to plan. Likewise, if I have my planners in meetings eight hours a day, they're not going to have time to plan. Planning requires concentrated time and connection of planners to planners. So we need to build organizations that allow planners to plan and allow people to build these playbooks. And that requires the reorganization of many roles within companies to be able to drive effectiveness. So Brian says, what are the indicators of a healthy SNOP? Well, I ask five questions when I go into the organization and I get clarity really early. What is the balance of SNOP? And the answer to that is usually pretty clear. Secondly, what is the goal? And when companies answer, you know, they want to trade off volume, then I say, how do you align for mix and what is value? And if they can answer the questions around the goal, then, you know, I know they're on the right path. The third question I ask is, how would you define the process? And if they define the process by laborious meetings that nobody comes to and everybody argues, we don't have the right cultural DNA. If they define meetings as a regular cadence where people have time to plan and it's a very focused work on opportunities and risk, it's a different ballgame. So getting people to talk to me about the process. The fourth is that connection of planning to execution. Is the SNOP plan just something we do as an idle process or is it something that's connected and tethered? And do we have alignment with the chief operating officer and we connect planning to execution? That is really an important role. And then the fifth is this governance issue. Is the sales and operations plan aligned to the profit center? And is that profit center well-defined in governance so that we understand the role of the local teams, the role of the regional teams, the role of the business teams, and the role of the global teams, and we're clear in governance about who should plan and make a decision. So to me, those are the effective characteristics. Now, Stephanie says that finance does not feel the pain of missing cross-functional alignment as much as supply chain. How do I convince finance to get more involved in SNOP? It's all about the opportunity. So network design, discrete event simulation, 
Um, you know, our research shows that I get a better price to tangible book value. It also shows that I have a much better balance sheet on slow and obsolete inventory. And so benchmarking, discrete event simulation, and talking the language of finance. So many people can't do that. They don't know what an inventory turn is or what cost of goods sold is or what EBITDA is. But talk in the language of finance. Don't talk in the wonk, wonk, wonk talk of supply chain. Be very business focused and really get into the process of what is value. And ask the finance team about what is value. Now, Garoff says that sometimes companies flip-flop on the strategy, which causes engineering work. And I think that's true when we don't have alignment on the strategy, which I like the analogy of the playbook from the football teams. I find a lot of uh, executive teams understand that because they've played football, and sometimes they understand football far better than they understand supply chain. So when you get a playbook and they flip-flop, You've got to help them to understand the implications of that flip-flop, either through simulation or network design. And we've got to manage the executive team so that they understand how a decision in SNOP ties to balance sheet activities. And that's not easy, and that's one of the reasons why we're releasing our discrete event simulation game, which simulates SNOP play, and we'll be actually playing this at our conference in September, and we're going to have companies to be able to play our game, to be able to see the impact on the metrics that matter based upon the decisions and strategy. But you can watch our work. We've been working with Lamasoft on building the game, and we're very excited about it. And we look forward to talking to you about that more as we release it in September. But let's just wrap up. So how do you get started? I think you pull up the chair in the finance team and you ask, what is value? And be ready for a pregnant pause and an uncomfortable discussion. And then have a discussion about how efficient or the lowest input is not value. And a balanced portfolio definition needs to really drive from that. Now, we define the balanced portfolio as growth, operating margin, inventory turns, and return on invested capital. You can use that as a starting place, but have finance help you with what is that balanced portfolio. It varies by company, uh, and you need to personalize that balanced portfolio for your company, and then start to align the vertical silos to it and put in our tools to visualize the impact of sales and operations planning strategies on that balanced portfolio. Then map your journey. I talked about you know, one of the obstacles is the role of the budget. Hit that head on. People that are good at this are good at network design and discrete event simulation. Build a team. People that are good at this are good at form and function of inventory. Start to analyze your inventories. Look at your slow and obsolete write-offs. Think about what was the impact of sales and operations planning decisions or flip-flops on that slow and obsolete inventory. And then build alignment against that strategy. Ask the hard questions. Look at the past year and really help people to see that if you had had an effective sales and operations planning process that goes cross-functionally, connected to revenue management, new product launch, and our work with suppliers, that you would have been able to resolve some issues that maybe you had with a new product launch or perhaps a supplier out of stock. Make it personal. Hit it home. And talk about what would have been that value for you in the prior year and continually question the status quo. We think there's a reason to take a different path, that only 10% of companies are making progress on a balanced portfolio in supply chain. And we think it's because our thinking is very narrow and we're not able to question traditional paradigms. And if that is also your concern, consider either working with us on benchmarking, satisfaction of your supply chain employees and testing alignment in SNOP or coming to our conference in September 
and listening to the case studies on cognitive computing, artificial intelligence, and new forms of visualization, because we think it's time to act differently. Okay, Helen, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Laura, and thanks to everyone that joined today. A few things to share before we end. As I mentioned, we will send out the slides and a recording link to everyone on this webinar, so keep an eye out for the follow-up email from us. We also encourage you to engage with us on social media by following us on Twitter and Facebook and joining our LinkedIn company page and follow us, following us on SlideShare. You can find the information on the slide deck. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Helen.